Okay, we're continuing on in our uh, discussion of variational methods or variational calculus. I want to talk today about something called the delta operator. And uh, I'm going to develop it, but it's basically a shorthand um, way to handle um, variations. As opposed to using this epsilon and eta, where eta is a test function, we're going to try to just reduce everything to a single um, a variation itself. Okay, so to start this, uh, let's first just re uh, revisit the development of the Euler-Lagrange equation for the following functional. Uh, the functional was given by i of u is equal to the integral from a to b of f, which is a function of x, u, and u prime dx. We'll call that equation one. And what did we do? Well, we began by introducing a family of varied functions that we called uh, u tilde of x, uh, and they were given as follows. Uh, we defined it as u tilde of x was, was equal to u of x um, plus epsilon times eta of x, right? And remember that u of x was the extremizing function. Let's call this equation two. So I'm going to introduce a definition now that we call the term a, epsilon times eta x the variation of u of x. And so we write the following that eta or that epsilon times eta of x is equal to uh, a, a quantity, this variation that we'll call delta u of x and we'll just shorten it and typically write that's equal to what we call delta u. So delta u is the variation. Call that equation three. So this quantity is the variation of u. So let's let's see if we can um, uh, illustrate what this variation is. So and we call this the delta operator. So what does this uh, delta operator do? Well, it represents a small arbitrary cha arbitrary change in the dependent variable u of x. And it represents uh, the arbitrary change for a fixed value of the independent variable x. So what does that mean? Um, that means that we don't associate a variation of delta x with delta u. Okay. So let me graphically show you what uh, delta u is. So let's let's look at a plot here. This will be u of x, and then the x-axis here will be horizontal so there's x and u of x and if we pick up pick a function let's say this um, this is what we would call u of x and we could do something like this right and this might be u tilde of x right and then this distance this distance in between that is delta u of x, okay? So what I mean by this is that uh, at any particular fixed value of x, delta u represents the um, variation between u of x and the varied path u tilde of x, okay? This is in contrast uh, to a true differential. So to see that, let's draw the kind of the same function and then think about it from a differential perspective. So here's x, here's u of x, and here's here's our function u, something like that. And in this case, right? If what what, what do I have here for this is du, and this is dx, right? And then the slope, right, is du dx, right? So. In the, in the case of a differential, there is a dx associated with it because it's it has to do with this change in the function as I go in x. In the case of a variation, it's simply the change, it's the difference rather uh, at a particular value of x between the, the extremizing function and the varied path, okay? So the point is that uh, a true differential, du, uh, has a dx that's associated with it. And, and you might be asking, well, what, why do we want to make this distinction? The reason that we do is that we're going to we're going to use in many ways the delta operator in the same 
uh, way that we use the differential operator, but there is this distinction that there is no such thing as delta x. There's only delta u. Okay, so there, that's I want to make that distinction because we're going to go ahead and and see that we can use things like a, a product rule or a chain rule with the delta operator, um, even though there's no um, dx uh, or delta x quantity. Okay, I want to look now at two special cases. Um, that will that you'll just need to know and sort of memorize for for uh, applications. So we can define the variation of any function u of x. And so let's consider the variation of the derivative. How about the variation of uh, du dx, right? And so this is also u prime. We could write this as delta u prime, right? Let's call that equation four. What does that look like? The only assumption that we're going to make here is that we can use the varied function u tilde um, also for the for its derivatives. Uh, so in that case, we can write equation four as follows. So we would say delta u prime is obviously equal to from equation four delta du by dx, right? Which we we uh, can define du by dx, uh, or rather the variation as um, that must be du tilde uh, dx minus du dx, right? So that that's the equivalent of saying that the variation is u tilde minus u. Now the variation of the derivative is the variation of the derivative the, of u tilde minus the derivative of u. Uh, I can take this differential operator out and write this as d by dx of the quantity u tilde minus u, which we know what u tilde minus u is. So this is just d by dx of delta u. Okay, let's call that equation five. So what we see is that the variation of the derivative is the derivative of the variation. They're equivalent, okay? So, and I'll just, I'm just going to note, we can do the exact same thing uh, in the case of an integral. So following uh, similar logic, uh, we can define the following. That the uh, variation of the integral of u of x dx uh, is equal to the integral of the variation of delta u of x dx, right? Call that equation six. So those are some identities that we're going to use um, as we move through this course. Okay, I'm not going to prove it. I'm just going to uh, state it that um, we can use the above to, to show that delta obeys all the basic rules of differential calculus. So let's, let's uh, as an example, consider a functional given as follows. Uh, we'll say this is f, uh, which is going to be f as a function of um, x. And I'm, I know we haven't talked about uh, multiple independent variables, but you'll get the idea here. Call it u1 of x, uh, u2 of x, uh, u3 of x, something like that. Uh, then I can uh, write the variation of f using the, the classic chain rule. This would be the partial of f then with respect to u, uh, uh, u1 rather, times delta u1 plus the partial of f with respect to uh, u2 times the variation of u2 plus the partial of f with respect to u3 times the variation of u3. What you don't see that you would see in a, in a classic derivative is, a, is a, uh, anything relating to the variation of x. Remember, we just said that that doesn't exist. So this is, we'll call this equation 7. So in contrast, we can uh, consider the differential of that function, right? And in that case, we would write that df, uh, this is just now applying our chain rule exactly, is the partial of f with respect to u1 uh, times du1 plus the partial of f uh, with respect to u2 times du2 plus the partial of f with respect to u3 times du3 and then this term that didn't exist in, uh, in an equivalent form above, which would be the partial of f with respect to x times dx, right? Call that equation 8. Okay, so th that's the distinction, but the, the operations are the same. So we don't have to learn a bunch of new things. We can just apply what we know from differential calculus. 
Okay, so let's let's go back to minimizing the functional that I gave in equation one, that the one we worked on thus far uh, exclusively in this class. And so we're going to write what the the value of f is um, in in a varied path. So we could write it as f is uh, f x is a function of x, um, and then the varied path then must be u um, plus delta u now, right? And u prime plus delta u prime, right? Call this equation 9. What I'm going to do is expand this function in a Taylor series. Uh, and it's going to be a first order Taylor series. If I do that, I can write that f of x u plus delta u and then u prime plus delta u prime Right, is it going to be equal to uh, f of x u and u prime, right? Plus, uh, now we can apply our rules from differential calculus, plus the partial of f with respect to u times delta u, right? Uh, plus the partial of f with respect to u prime times delta u prime, plus something that's of order, I'll just call it delta squared, right? Let's call that equation 10. Now I can go ahead and substitute equation 10 into equation 1 and carry out the integration. Okay, and when I do that, I have the integral from a to b of, um, of f of x u plus delta u and u prime plus delta u prime dx is equal to the integral from a to b of f x u and u prime dx plus the integral I'm going to, I'm kind of breaking these out I could combine them all but uh, you'll see why a partial of f with respect to u times delta u plus partial of f with respect to u prime times delta u prime dx uh, plus the integral from a to b of something that's of order delta squared dx. Okay? I'm not quite done. I want to do just a little bit of simplification, so we'll come down. All I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this this first integral on the right-hand side and subtract it off. So I'm left with the quantity integral from a to b, and I'll try to write it a little more compressed here, of f of x u plus delta u, u prime plus delta u prime dx minus the integral from a to b of f of x u and u prime dx is equal to the integral from a to b of the quantity the partial of f with respect to u times the variation of u plus the partial of f with respect to u prime times the variation of u prime dx plus the integral from a to b of something that's the order of delta squared dx. Let's call that equation 11. Okay. So what, what do I have here? Well, this term here, we already have defined it, right? We know what this is. This term is I of u, right? As defined in equation one. This term, right, is, is really a, an I tilde term, right? The variation of that functional, right? Or not the variation, the varied a path of that functional. So now let me introduce a definition. So the first variation of the functional i is defined by delta i is equal to i tilde minus i. Right? Call this equation 12. And so what you see up here is that I have i tilde minus i, right? Um, so that's the first part of this definition. So the first variation of the functional is given by this, where only the first order terms in delta are obtained. What does that mean? That means that this quantity, the integral from a to b of something that's of order delta squared uh, dx is taken to be zero, okay? And so then we get the following, that delta i is equal to, so the first variation of i is equal to the integral from a to b 
of the quantity partial of f with respect to u, for, uh, the variation of times the variation of u plus the partial of f with respect to u prime times the variation of u prime, that quantity times dx. Let's call that equation 13. Okay, we're going to integrate the second uh, term in this integral by parts. And we have then that delta i is going to be equal to, I'll just write the first term out and leave it out, integral from a to b of the partial of f with respect to u times the variation of u times dx, right? That's the first term. Then we integrate the next term by parts. So plus, integrating this by parts gives me partial of f with respect to u prime uh, times delta u now, instead of delta u prime. But that's evaluated from a to b, minus the integral from a to b of the partial of, sorry, of uh, d by dx of the partial of f with respect to u prime times now uh, delta u dx. Okay? Let's call this equation 14. A couple things to note. Uh, we require that the variation at the endpoints um, be zero. Right? So that means that uh, delta uh, u evaluated at A is equal to delta of u evaluated at B, which is identically zero, right? So then we can, we can uh, rewrite, so we can use this and rewrite equation 14, and it, then it becomes delta i is equal to the integral from A to B of, uh, of the quantity partial f with respect to u times delta u. Oops, let me, I'm going to factor out the delta u. So partial f with respect to u minus d by dx uh, partial f with respect to u prime delta u dx, right? Let's call that equation 15. So so this, we're getting close now. So think about what do we do uh, with the regular derivative if we want to find the extreme value of a function, right? Well, we set the derivative, the first derivative, equal to zero and then solve for x, right? Okay, similarly, if we want to extremize a functional, we set the first variation to zero and solve for u. Okay, so what does that mean when we, in this case, in equation 15, that means we take the first variation, which is delta i, set it equal to zero, and then that must be equal to the integral from a to b of uh, partial f with respect to u minus d by dx of partial of f with respect to u prime delta u times dx, call this equation 16, and now we just apply the fundamental lemma of variational calculus. And, and when we do that, right, what is, what is that fundamental lemma said? It says if, if, um, the integral, uh, of some function times some arbitrary function is always identically equal to zero, that this function must equal zero, right? And so when we do that, we're going to recover the exact Euler-Lagrange equations that we previously developed with the full, more formal definition. Right, so we end up with this quantity partial f with respect to u minus d by dx uh, times the partial of f with respect to u prime, right? And then so, uh, we were, we've been using it basically multiplied by negative one to, to give us the d by dx of partial of f with respect to u prime minus partial of f with respect to u. Uh, is all equal to zero, right? Call that equation 17. So what did we just show? We just showed that uh, taking an, an approach that uses the delta operator leads to the same Euler-Lagrange equations uh, that we did when we had a more formal definition of the varied path, and we we used uh, we we minimized epsilon if you remember, and then used eta as a test function. So we get the same re result either way. Um, so I just mentioned then that in future lectures, we're going to just continue to use this delta operator to carry out the variational process.